Italian Spider-Man. Pronto. <laughs> Terrore Suspenso Spider, 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 spider 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 Hey everybody, welcome to Star Citizen Live Italian <laughs> Spider-Man I'm Italian Spider-Man, I'm your host, Jared Huckabee uh, It's Halloween weekend And I... I didn't feel like doing Count Disco this year, so, so. This is this is what you end up with. Sorry, everybody. Uh, welcome to Star Citizen Live Game Dev Outlaw Lifestyle. Uh, if you've never seen Star Citizen Live before, it's where we take about an hour out of the end of our week, hang out with our developers, and either discuss a little bit of our development or showcase a little bit of our development. Uh, this week's episode is a little different. Uh, uh, if you remember from CitizenCon, uh, just like two weeks ago, I think, uh, we had a whole bunch of different showcases going on. One of those was a, a lovely uh, a, a Josh Van Zulen uh, showing his process of creating the uh, interiors of the uh, outlaw space stations. Now, Josh, because he came prepared and is wonderful at his job, created an entire hour long presentation for us. And then when we fit it in with the rest of the day, we're like, you got five minutes. You got five minutes, so we uh, we slaughtered the heck out of that set, out of that out of that segment for for Sizicon. But he's back, he's back today. Uh, where was, where's my screen saying? Josh, how you doing, man? Doing all right. How you doing, man? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm bring me a macchiato. <laughs> uh, no. I, I considered doing the voice the entire time, and I'm like, no, that's just, that's. I was about to say, like, I was kind of expecting it, but no, 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 no. No. All right, so so Josh, uh, outlaw space stations are a, a big uh, feature of the upcoming Pyro system. Um, they are they are uh, some of the they're, they're few and far between in the system, but w w uh, so that means that when you encounter them, they're incredibly important. They are they are life throughout the verse. So uh, at this point, because this is your show here. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Let's just jump right into it. Uh, what are we doing today? Sure, absolutely. So um, for those of you who, who didn't tune in to, to SitCon, um, I'm Josh Van Zulen, uh, Principal Environment Artist here at, at Cloud Imperium Games. And uh, basically what we're going to do is we're going to expand on that talk that we did at SitCon a little bit. So it was only like a tiny snippet of what we really had there so we're going to tread like some of the same ground but it's going to make a lot more sense in the broad scheme of things and uh we're going to go into a lot more depth in regards to the actual development process uh figuring out how we actually start these locations and build them out and uh figure out kind of these really key aspects along the way so like certain things like uh figuring out uh what the art direction is for a starting point right so we have key bits of art that we're trying to actually establish and uh, then reapply that into the actual game setting and then finding out where there are holes within the art style itself so uh, maybe the concept team or the art director hadn't necessarily thought about how the art style would work in this one particular instance or how it would particularly combine with the game design that we're actually needing to put in there because we are making a game. And then also figuring out not only the, um, only the, just the general workflow for the location, but what the limitations are in terms of what tech we have available to us, how much physical stuff we can put in the location. And uh, then just like figuring out those real problem areas where we're going to run into issues and then address those and then react to those and then try and find you know creative solutions to to problems so this is the the earliest part of the development process just after concept art so this is pre-production on the actual location and um basically everything you'll see here is not 
basic, it's not exactly what you'll see in the final product, but it is a very solid foundation for figuring out what we actually will need to do. And some of this stuff will actually survive well and truly into, into the final uh, product for sure. Um, this is my first time seeing this for a while. So it's, it's a little bit of a nostalgia trip because uh, uh, it's moved on quite a bit from now, from this point, but um, it's, there's still a lot of elements that are fairly similar, right? So it's not a wasted opportunity or time within development. It's actually incredibly critical for figuring out how we can build these things in a time efficient manner uh, as efficiently as possible and whatnot. So without further ado, let's, let's just dig in, right? So what you can see here on, on my screen right now is something we're all fairly familiar with. This is the Stanton Systems uh, rest stops. So one of the food courts here, what we're going to do is we're going to actually going to use this as a base. The, the idea here being that we can take um, well, the Pyro system, which is an, has a lot older space stations here. Maybe they were developed by the same corporation and whatnot, and they're not, you know, every corporation tries to save money here or there. Um, and they've used the exact same module in the Sansa system or in Pyro or vice versa, whichever came first. Uh, the Pyro systems ones being not as well maintained, of course, but this is going to be our base. So we're going to see how we can start to get some easy wins without having to completely redesign uh, all of the modules that work already with our procedural system, right? So what we're going to do, um, and fingers crossed this doesn't crash, is I'm going to turn off this version and um, just quickly, well, I'm going to delete it. And then get rid of Elroy's as well, by Elroy's. And then turn on our one. So this is kind of what we opened on at SITCON. So this is basically the exact same thing, but what we've done is we've grabbed every single brush or mesh within the scene and dragged up the wear to the maximum level on it, right? So the idea here being that we needed to really see whether or not we needed to go in and make a brand new material set for all of these panels on the sides here or whether or not we can get away with just using the existing texture sets right it's it's the question of do we actually have to invest time and resources into developing something that could potentially take months of work for an artist or can we just use what we already have and fortunately so far uh the answer is that we can pretty much use exactly what we've got here so far, right? There's a few little additions here or there, which we'll get into a little bit later on, where you can see that we've uh, had to go in and, and make a few materials, but it's substantially less than what we would have had to if we were making a brand new material set, right? So, cool. So that's basically where we are here. What we've done is we've gone through and we've just stripped out all of the essential, all, all of the prop work that was done in here originally, and we're just trying to keep it uh, down to its original shell as much as possible. Uh, Another thing on top of this is what we've done is that we identified pretty early on that uh, the the optimization in this area could have been a lot better. And so we've gone in and we've actually uh, tightened up a lot of the things, especially around this center area here. So we've we've added a lot of things like uh, we've added vis areas basically, and vis areas is is how we kind of control occlusion volumes within our game. You'll see a lot more of that further as we go on as well. But this was one of the things we super early found out about and just addressed here. So these will, um, at this level, run a lot nicer than the old ones, but uh, we're putting a lot more into these. So ultimately, it's a balancing act, right? Cool. So from this point, uh, we're, we're going to start to try and establish some of the, the key concept art that we had. So what, what we were identified really quickly with this stuff is that it's really important to start from a, a base of just like complete darkness when you're when you're building these things. So right now I've just got working lights on and I'll show you exactly why, right? So um, up here, we have all of this roof that is quite easily visible with the working lights on. But ultimately when we're actually in the game with the correct lighting, so if I turn on the lighting and turn off our working lights, you can see that we can't see the roof at all. <laughs> <laughs> so this is super important because that means that we don't need to spend, you know, days and days modeling all of this intricate kind of pipework and machinery that we can go and put up in the roof, right? 
we can just let it fall into darkness and and it's pretty good right worst case scenario if we did find that we needed to like do some dressing work there we can do some minimal work but it's mostly in darkness so we we, we get away with it right it's about spending the time where you need to spend the time so we're, we're getting a lot of mood that's coming through right here right now and this is very close to what we had in in one of the concepts that we were looking at what we've got is a big key light big area key light coming up from the top left here that's just shooting through everything we've got some particles happening some rain and uh, we've got a little bit of fire over the side here which is just floating out in space so this is already starting to look nice we've got another light over here the idea here was that we didn't want the light to touch the second level we wanted to keep it in this level so as these two levels start to meld together in terms of lighting because we're actually going to have a market down here you're going to get a whole bunch of like warmth and different colors down the bottom and then you're going to get this stark cold difference uh with the area above because these space stations are they're pretty much not working right the life support isn't there there's absolutely no utilities and there's pretty much no lighting right and the lighting that is there is like only being held together with duct tape pretty much so in general, everything's really cold apart from where um, people are trying to live and those places are premium real estate, right? So um, moving on from that, we're gonna go in and we're just gonna add in a little bit of dressing with some cables here. So this is just adding in a little bit more of that, you know, reinforcing the fact that they've had to go in and jerry-rig this thing to make it, you know, remotely habitable, right? By sneaking through all of these cables throughout the entire space station to, you know, maybe power heaters, power portable life support systems or, or anything of the sort, right? Maybe it's just to open like one of the automatic doors that needs to have power powered to it right so they're sneaking all these things from temporary generators all the way through the location right so that's what we're thinking about here um and then another thing and this is what i mentioned before is that um this right now this picture here apart from the glows that we're getting from the marketplace is pretty much straight on point with with the concept art that we were given for the location but one thing that was not accounted for in the concept art is that um this area as a marketplace uh, is going to have this dynamic between the normal people downstairs at the market who are buying and selling stuff and then the gang who is actually controlling these locations right so we wanted to create this structure where the people down the bottom are not oppressed but like there's this ever looming gang presence that they're there right so the gangs are all up in this top area and uh have kind of made it like their their main hideout so hey josh yes i'm sorry before you go do you want to explain the rain at this point? Okay, yeah, I can explain the rain. So <laughs> th this will become a little bit more apparent as, as we start like turning things on later on. But the rain is, uh, as a disclaimer, it's way too intense right now, right? And um, the idea is that this is, um, there's such a stark kind of heat difference or temperature difference in this space. When we have the market downstairs, and uh, this huge volume, basically, we have all of the steam from the markets, people cooking things and whatnot, all rising up to the roof and then condensing on uh, the roof itself, bits of machinery, lots of the girder work or, or cables and whatnot, and uh, then just slowly dripping down and um, ultimately potentially being collected uh, by, by the people living in the station, right? Because water is a valuable resource. And uh, basically, it needs to well obviously it wouldn't be as intense as it, is, as it is right now but also we would want to introduce a little bit of frost into it as well because some of it would technically freeze as it comes down because it's cold enough um so this is base the reason why we've got this here is that we can just explore that idea and see how it would feel within a space like this and it's a mental note as well to the the vfx team that when they come in and do their pass because uh, vfx haven't touched this this is just me finding particle systems randomly throughout our, our library the vfx guys can go in and go oh they want rain here okay i'll, I'll hit up the the artist why they did that and then we can figure out the logic behind it and then they can do a feasible particle effect for it right right <laughs> it it's basically a marker for some for another team down the line to be like hey you need to fix this 
Yeah, absolutely. And to just validate it with with art direction and and CR, right? Because ultimately, if if you show this to to the to the directors and they go, what what the hell? Why is there rain? That's so stupid. Then I want to know about it as early as possible, right? Because this dictates a lot of the the work that goes into the environment narratively and artistically. So sorry for derailing. That's... You can go. Is it all right? <laughs> um, but yeah, so. In terms of the gang up upstairs, one of the things that we need to do is we need to just create a gated experience uh, for those guys where um, if you are not of a certain reputation with the gang, you don't have access to those spaces, right? So um, one of those things is adding in a checkpoint over here. So if you're in favor with the gang, you'll be able to go through this checkpoint. If you're not in favor, then you won't. Um, you'll probably get attacked. You probably shouldn't be on the station to begin with if you're not in favor um if you're neutral then you won't get in but they won't kill you right so anyways it's kind of just a strong point for them to defend their main hub which is going to be behind them here so what i've gone in and done is just take one of our existing catwalk sets so i'm going to turn on our working light so we can see it a little bit better uh, so this is an existing catwalk set that we've already had with within the um, game at the moment and the reason we're using this because it's a little bit too chunky at the moment is just to feel out whether or not this is something that we can you know viably use uh in in this space right now or if we have to actually make a brand new catwalk set right and what we've discovered is that this is actually a little bit too chunky to like a little bit too substantial for the gang to actually use within this location and uh, so we've actually taken measures now in development where we're having artists go in and make alterations to the set so that we can make it look a little bit more haphazardly put together, right, without a professional installer coming in and doing this for them, right? So this was a very important thing to kind of establish and figure out, is this something we can get away with? The answer is not really. So we're, we're going in and making adjustments to that, right? So. Past this, we're going to go in and add a little bit more dressing work here. So one of the one of the artistic intents that we established really early on in production is that um, Ian, the art director, really didn't want to see the walls as much as possible. So um, you'll see a little bit more uh, of this as I go in, but we're, we're starting to cover it up with a lot of more of these soft surface elements, right, which is also relating a lot more to the culture that we have on the the planets themselves like you would have seen like there's a lot quite a lot of soft surface elements inside the um outposts that we have on those planets as well so it's kind of like creating a relationship here as well but it also helps us cover up a lot of the original walls within the space station itself right so we're adding in a lot more of that what we've gone in and done as well is adding in like these like kind of barriers that kind of keep like a, kind of a bunker vibe from inside so you get like a little slot here which you can shoot through and uh, a few cover points here where they could potentially take someone out who was charging in if again takeover decided to take place right so we got a few of those things um i'm going to turn off our lights get that mood back in and then so now generally during this process i'd be doing a lighting pass but for the sake of simplicity here i'm just going to turn it on so this is the lighting that we've gone for the in for this place in particular one of the things that uh we wanted to get across here is that it's not a comfortable place to really be standing um as is as is evident by my little um scene here with the scale refs so one of the ways that we've done that is by introducing these red lights around the place. And um, these are actually sort of double duty. These are also portable heaters. So they're keeping people warm within the cold environment, but they also give us that little bit of red light, which is a little bit menacing, right? On top of that, we've got floodlights that are just like blinding people as they come around. And there's a lot of forward facing lights on the actual uh, checkpoint itself, right? So we're kind of creating this really cool mood and uh, ultimately trying not to impact the original keyframe with our concept art too much, which is, is being fairly successful here. We're getting a little bit of a call out with the light, but it's actually not too bad. So we're, we're actually being fairly successful in this regard. Cool. So on top of that, there's, there's still a few things missing for, from this image in particular. So I mentioned that we wanted to not see the walls as much, right? 
And one of the ways that we're doing that on, on power stations is through the use of like uh, graffiti, right? And we've, we've used graffiti a little bit in the game so far, but we've not used graffiti to the same degree that we're going to be using graffiti here. So we wanted to um, basically cover everything in graffiti. The graffiti that you're going to see right here, take it with a pinch of salt, it's not like the actual final art stuff. This is just stuff that we've thrown in just to see if what the way we envisioned it would work would work. So don't, don't take it too seriously. So you can see the Rest and Relax logo up here on the wall. If I turn on our graffiti layer here, you can start to see it starting to get a little bit occluded by a lot of this graffiti, right? We've also got this wall down here, which has completely disappeared. So if I toggle on and off, you can see it's like very much like almost camouflaged in. If I turn around as well, we've got this wall back here. You can see the difference that that makes. And it kind of disguises the, the actual building set that we're using. Not that we necessarily want to hide it, but it creates a variance within the environment enough that, again, it means that we don't have to create completely brand new assets. And it gives us this unique art style that is, is different to any other location, right? It's also gone in and added just like a few bits of variance along the floors. And uh, we've got some emissive logos that the gangs, um, they like to use emissive paints for all of their um, graffiti and whatnot. So we're gonna get a lot more of that stuff in as well. Here, it's pretty early, so I won't show too much of that. But so yeah, if basically, if graffiti was our, our bread, then um, this next thing is gonna be our butter. And that is rubbish. So rubbish is super integral on these station, space stations. Like I said before, like, these, they're not well kept at all. No one, there's no real administration apart from, I guess you could say the gang. The gang doesn't care. Just, as long as like stuff works and they get their money at the end of the day, that's pretty much it. So things just get kicked to the side and um, just slowly built up over time, right? So we're going to get big, uh, big piles of, of rubbish that happen. It's going to be bottles and broken things everywhere. Not the most sanitary place to be in the verse, right? The thing with... with um, with the rubbish, and, and you'll start seeing this more as we keep going, is that it's actually quite a difficult thing to get the balance right. So we actually have to create, a, it's, I say sculpted, it sounds arty farty, but it's it's pretty much we're sculpting the way that we're putting these uh, rubbish clusters around. So we have to figure out how it would logically gather up within the environment and be pushed to the side or people be, you know, easily be able to put it somewhere so they just put it there versus here or whatnot right so we're thinking about that and you can kind of start to see that here where the pathway is straight through the middle of this barrier here it's mostly clear and then we've got this build up on the side right same thing here as well it's built up here and then the main pathway is is kept relatively clean so that's pretty much rubbish now the rubbish thing um is a very um well, it raised a lot of alarm bells as we were doing this, right? And the reason being is that uh, it's an insane amount of objects to start plastering around everywhere, right? And um, our entity counts in the game at the moment are already so high that we're, we've, we can't add anything more into the game without taking stuff out, right? So we want to avoid that as much as possible. And also it just means that in general, the game runs faster if you're, not, if you're loading in less objects. Uh, is a general rule of thumb, right? These are these are what are called draw calls, technically, uh, normally, and um, we want to reduce them as much as possible, right? So one of the examples of like these uh, rubbish piles just really not doing us any favors is back here. So I'll turn on my working lens so we can see this again. So we've got a huge pile of rubbish here, right? And can I interact with you? Yeah. So you can see that we have like a huge amount of objects all contributing to this one pile of trash over here in the corner. And it, it really just, it doesn't need to be like this. We, we could do this with just one object if we wanted to, and we could combine a whole bunch of textures together and really reduce down that the cost of the individual asset. Individually, this doesn't cost anything, like say whatever, but you start multiplying it across an entire space station, you know, hundreds, thousands of these assets, you're, you're not going to have a fun time, right? So this is, this is us identifying a problem. And then as we go into production, 
uh, the props team is actually going to go in and, and create a kit for us where all of these are one object and it will be nice. Point here a little bit. When he says you can't add things without taking things away, it means that we've created these 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 levels that have tens of thousands of objects and stuff like this and we figured out like, that's where the performance is now we have to get smarter and find new ways of doing it which is what he's discussing so you can't just add objects to a game infinitely any game in existence that all hits has a performance cost so we have to uh, invent new processes and new procedures to make that efficiently so it's don't take one little sound bite out of context and take the whole thing Continue. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a thing that games have done forever, right? Like you have like multiple objects baked down into one all the time. So it's nothing out of the ordinary, but uh, yeah, in our instance here, we've not done such a substantial amount of rubbish as, as we are now. So it's something that we've had to identify, right? So cool. Right now, uh, so let's go and explore the marketplace then. So we'll go downstairs. So the eagle eyed among you probably would have spotted Elroy's. Elroy's has uh, seen better days. So one of the things when we're looking at these locations is we're asking ourselves, okay, how can we sell the narrative story within, within them, right? And uh, funnily enough, El Elroy's was here and uh, I needed more space to put the market in. And um, I, I can't remember if it was me or someone else in a meeting uh, just, just joked and said, why don't we just drive a forklift through it? And so that's literally what I did. I literally just drove a forklift straight through Elroy's. And that's given me so much more room to play stuff. And it's narrative storytelling, right? It's like, oh, it was someone wanted more room, which is the truth. And just drove a forklift straight through it. <laughs> so this is, like an easy win it's a bit of fun as an artist to do uh just to try to sell these things and it also serves the purpose of giving us more space within the environment as well we've also completely gutted out our roys so we've got no furniture in there anymore um and you'll see what we put in there in a sec so um from this point we've got a really open environment and um as in the same vein as what we were talking about with with the rubbish we need to consider um, our view lines and how many objects we're drawing onto the screen at any given point. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to go and, and kind of subdivide this space up a little bit. We're going to add in a few walls here and there, blocking volumes and, uh, and whatnot. And that will enable us to effectively cull large portions of the environment uh, so that we can keep the frames up as, as much as possible, right? So this is a very critical thing to establish early on in the process. So. As you can see, a few walls have appeared and a few blocking elements have appeared. We've got a big wall back here, which is funneling us into a certain point. So you can see that we can, you know, basically not draw uh, entire portions of, of the marketplace here, just with these walls. Same with this one back here. So as we're approaching, if this was to be an entrance into the marketplace, we're doing the exact same thing. We do have a, a big sign of, uh, line of sight straight through the middle here. <laughs> So that would be, you know, maybe a, a thing that we'd bring up and say, okay, that's a concerning thing. Maybe we need to create another blocking volume or maybe offset these two volumes from uh, one or these two barriers from one another, right? To, to solve that. These are the sort of things we're looking at. And then Alroy's itself has gone through a pretty major change. And this is probably the most developed uh, of all of them. So we've actually gone in, we've, we've really subdivided Alroy's up heaps. So this is actually gonna become more of a slum. So. Uh, the mannequins are kind of giving it away a little bit in here, uh, but where we've got a room here and then we've got this alleyway that's running through here. And then back here, we've also got another room as well. So, and if I turn on our, our Visary debug, right? I spoke about this a bit before. You can see that we're starting to break up these into different, different zones. Uh, in, in the production version of this environment, we actually have this split up now. Uh, but when we were doing this for SICCON, it, it, it hadn't gotten to that point yet. But all of these areas have their own colors associated with them, which means that they're all in their own vis areas, which means they can all be culled independently from one another, uh, which will just make the game run a lot faster in the, at the end of the day. Cool. 
So we've, we've gone and done a little bit of that. Now we need to start getting in the actual Marker Vibe itself. So a lot of stuff is going to happen right now. And uh, basically, as I turn on the stalls here, so the stalls are basically the, the whole reason you come to the, these markets, right, is that they sell every single type of little knickknack, whether it's good or bad quality. The, the food is suitably street food quality. And um, it's just, you know, it's like the most lively place uh, with Empire itself, right? So we've gone in and we've really like tried to get in that cramped street market vibe as much as possible. One of the the things that we really needed to be careful about with these things is that uh, while it's cramped and not a lot of room to go around and do stuff, that there was still room to go around and do stuff, right? So one of the things that was um, raised as, an, as a, concern immediately was that um, the AI needed to be able to navigate this space, right? So we have a minimum space that which uh, the AI can like pass through areas. And we had to make sure that we were keeping that in mind when developing these spaces, right? So one of those was like this area here, making sure that that is large enough that two AI minimum can pass one another. And thankfully this, this is after a little bit of adjustment, right? But also, discovering uh, that the, the AI can't move under, or if, if the height, if there's a height restriction as well, right? It's just something we didn't think about when we, were, when we were making this is that the AI has a minimum height. It makes sense when you think about it, right? They're not gonna pathfind under somebody's bed. You'd hope not at least. So what we actually discovered is that these stalls themselves, the roofs were so low that they were occluding the, uh, the navigation mesh here. So that meant if we had two stalls facing each other, literally AI couldn't walk down, even though it met the minimum uh, width uh, requirements, it didn't meet the height requirements. So they literally couldn't walk past. So we actually had to go in and address these legacy assets, which, well, I say legacy, they're not really, but like they're from Art Corp. So um, they're a bit older. We had to go in and readdress those to fix the navigation issues with them. And uh, yeah, so that we could use them in this environment as well if we wanted to. But it also means that as, as environment artists, we can go in and go, okay, I, I need to make sure that my, my roofs are, are at a reasonable height or any other kind of thing hanging around the place because we've got quite a lot of stuff hanging off the roof. Speaking of roofs, so because we've got all of this rain happening within the environment um, or just water drops or whatever you want to call it, uh, they've gone in and actually started constructing a temporary roof as well. This will aid in them being able to not only keep dry, but collect the water that comes back down. So what, we, what we'll do is we'll go in and we'll start putting little collection like buckets or, or tubs or whatever around the place as well. And where VFX come in, they'll be able to do a whole bunch of really cool water effects around the place as well. So that's really cool. But one of the things that the main reasons other than that, that we've done this roof stuff is that we really want to get a sense of parallax with, with the actual cavity itself. So as we look up through the space, you can see that we're getting like a lot of different levels of depth within it, right? If I turn off my working lights, you can start to see that a little bit better as well. So you can see all of those different layers that we're getting within the environment. And that's ultimately what we're after. We want to make you feel cramped, but also understand that you're in quite a large cavernous space as well. So that's why we, we, we've gone in and done the roofs. And um, again, that suffers from the same issue with, with the rubbish. Like there's way too many objects that are making up the roof at the moment. So we're going to have to go in and, and just create like merged versions of those where five entities go down to just one basically. So it's a common thing of, of that throughout the entire environment. So from here, I'm just going to go in and uh, just add a few props. So just like some tables and chairs. Uh, we've got a, a, a planter fire happening in the background because um, there, there wasn't any dumpsters. I couldn't find any dumpsters on the original station dressing. So it's a planter. Um, and uh, yeah, so from this point, we're, we're missing a little bit of um lighting it within the scene right so at the moment it's just being entirely lit by the stalls uh the stalls have actually progressed a lot further on from where they were um a while back so we actually have a lighting pass already done on them 
so they're they already have lights built in into them but um we're still not getting the exact vibe we want we don't have any fog we've got areas like this which is going to complete darkness which is fine but not in the middle of a market right if people are walking around here and this is a high traffic area you'd expect it to kind of be lit up so like I mentioned before, what we did upstairs, we'd be doing this pass as we were, you know, figuring everything out anyways. Uh, but again, for the simplicity, I'll just turn it on. So uh, as I mentioned in, in the SICON talk, we're now getting the thickness that we need from the lighting and the atmosphere within, within the environment. The fog really helps bring in that, like there's a lot of stuff happening here. People are cooking food, there's smoke from machines going, from the fires even as well and whatnot it just helps us get a lot more of the vibe we're after within this within this environment as well and you'll also notice that this area here isn't falling into as much darkness as before now right cool all right and if i travel down here so you can see our alleyway that we were looking at before in alroy's is starting to feel a little bit more kind of i don't know dark and moody and a little bit scary i guess in a way so we're starting to get a lot more of that in now as well. So another thing that was super important and a, and a, a principle that we had within the we, within the environment um, that we wanted to get in was this uh, idea that well, this, the station's got no power, so power needs to be generated from somewhere. And we, we tried to combine this with the idea that the gang is asking for protection money. So like you would pay your protection money which would give you power that sort of vibe if you know what i mean so what we have back here is a, a generator room right so this room back here is going to be filled with a whole bunch of generators and we've got a little engineer area here as well uh which is cool potential for gameplay if if we get that in and um it's just selling that narrative vibe right so with with that whole idea of us having a, a generator room uh we need to and and that is associated with the the stalls and people having to pay protection money we need a way of clearly uh displaying that throughout the entire environment right so what we've gone in and done is add in some cables to connect everything this is a lot of cables a lot a lot a lot of cables so <laughs> the cables themselves was a a very interesting uh thing to kind of figure out within the environment because cables are inherently kind of hard to do when uh you have to place thousands of them because there's thousands of them and uh this space back here in the actual generator room itself this alone just to figure out I try a few designs different layouts see what worked this alone took me like an entire day of work just to do in editor just placing around cables figuring out what looks good and whatnot right trying it through a few different designs and ultimately it's it's just a lot of busy work that's hard to do um not it's not necessarily hard to do it's just it's not good on the system and by that i mean it, it's not good on the artist when they have to do a million clicks all the time placing a million cables it um we don't want everyone to get uh an injury right at work from doing that so we needed to come up for a solution for that and also to get the time down so we've we've done a number of things right uh which I'll get into in a sec. Now, in in when looking at all of these cables, right, you can go, okay, yeah, let's let's place a whole bunch of cables throughout the entire environment. Now, there's a number of challenges that come with that. One is that uh, it's generally you don't want to be placing one cable at a time, right? Because that's it's just not going to happen. So what we've gone in and done is we've actually clustered all these things together. That means less clicks for the artist. To actually go in and place these things and uh, it also means uh, less less draw calls so again keeping in mind the efficiency and uh, it just makes it a lot easier to place now in terms of placing um, in in game development generally cables and stuff have been done through uh, a, a spline system right now unfortunately we don't actually have one uh, in in the engine at the moment uh, 
so we requested one. We, we asked like, what's the potential of us actually being able to get one for these stations? And um, unfortunately tech came back and said, we're actually prioritizing on these other things for that release. So we can't get them in for that one. So based on that, right, it's, it's sad, but uh, it means that we also have to come up with creative solutions around those issues in development, right? So one of the ways that we've done that is by basically just creating the cable kit. Some of these cables are already actually used within the game itself. So we didn't actually have to create too many more assets, but it's just a kit of assets where instead of placing um, a big spline throughout the entire environment, we would actually be creating a modular kit. So these cables would connect from uh, point to point to one another, just like you would like your, your standard wall kit that we, we might be using along the walls here or all the floors or whatnot. It's just with cables. So like this section running down here is like made up of, of two, two segments of modular cable kit, right? The challenge comes when uh, you try and make it not look like a modular kit, right? And that's what we really need to work out and, and, and figure out within the environment, right? And there's a number of ways we can do that, right? And this next thing uh, will, will contribute significantly to that. Now, on the subject of also just adding in like heaps and heaps of cables, we needed to find a way of reducing the amount of clicks, reducing the amount of assets we're going in and doing that. And, and adding those clusters of, of cables definitely helps, but we still weren't getting the level of density that we were ultimately after with the cables. So what we actually did is we, we went in and we took the, uh, the cables that we had made or this cable trim texture that we had made for the uh, outpost Sunpire and um, created a 3D version of it and then transferred that 3D version to a flat texture, right? And what we're doing then is that flat texture of those 3D pipes, we're then just creating like a shell around the actual 3D pipes within the environment to give us, give us that extra layer of thickness. So if I zoom in on this, you'll start to see it just completely breaks down as, as the parallax occlusion mapping just dies on, on these cables here. And this is how we're doing it, right? We're adding a significant amount of density and thickness by just having 2D cables throughout the entire uh, length of of cable here, right? So that means that we're not each individual one of these isn't a isn't an actual cable that we have to place. It's just one big mesh that just encapsulates the entire, uh, like I guess, bunch of, of physical three D cables. And this really helps not only with like just reducing poly count within the scene, draw calls, but also stops artists from going insane, which is ultimately uh, a, a very important thing as well. <laughs> so these things are snaking all the way through the environment. They're coming through here. You can see we're mixing the 2D ones with 3D cables as well. This is that like kind of slum area that we were talking about before. And uh, ultimately they will go through the entire environment as well. So this was, um, this area in particular was another example of like figuring out the minimum height for AI, right? This is the minimum height that we can have for a space and have AI navigate around it. And uh, as you can see, we actually got two levels. So we got a level on, on below and above. This creates a really nice dynamic within the scene. So yeah, uh, that's cables and a little bit more of AI. So from here, what we're just gonna be doing is, is basically adding a little bit more uh, of the moving elements within the scene. So we're gonna go in and add a little bit of VFX. So this is adding in just like some heat haze, a little bit of steam and whatnot. These effects right now are just like the placeholder effects like we were talking about before with the rain. Uh, they're just to sell the intent to the, the VFX team and at least have something in there uh, to show the directors in reviews. And uh, then ultimately when this gets pushed into production and the VFX guys come in, they'll make you know actually good looking particle effects or use existing ones they may already have that I don't know about and um, make it look spicy. So got that in here we've got more fire happening i think in some places we have the occasional spark i think down here yep so we've got some of these cables shorting out or whatnot it's it's not very well made that's the idea right is that these things are so you look at it you just like i ain't touching that that's the vibe we're after so 
we've gone in and we've done a few, uh, a whole bunch of that. Now, the other thing that we need to look at is, um, and this is a concept that we, we really introduced and double downed on uh, for Orison, and that is uh, the, the moving and dynamic objects uh, within the environment, right? So um, in, on Orison, uh, I, I personally worked on the industrial platform, Providence platform, and on that one, we played around with two animations. So we have the, the crane animation, which moves cargo around the platform. And we also have the uh, the engine display where it explodes out and tells you about the engine and stuff like that, right? That sort of stuff is super important to sell the life of an, of an environment. Um, and uh, we, we learn a lot doing those on Orison. Unfortunately for Pyro, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to have you know an engine display exploding or a crane moving around cargo, at least in this specific setting. So the route that we've actually gone down uh, with introducing a lot more movement within our scenes in that regard is through uh, the, the physics within the scene, right? So on Horizon, we played a, a lot around with cloth. Cloth, that was like the first time that we really got proper amounts of physicalized cloth within the game itself. And here we're, we're pretty much achieving or trying to achieve the next level of that, right? It's just not just the occasional flag everywhere. It's like how many, how many of these surfaces can we physicalize in an environment at the same time, right? The answer is not all of them, <laughs> as you probably would suspect, but um, we're trying to figure out how much we can um, get away with within the space itself. And on top of that, we also have cables. So we're bringing in, this is the first time that we're bringing in physicalized cables. So you'll be able to walk in, um, watch them move around as they get blown around in the wind and interact with them as, as a player as well. Now I've not turned it on because um, I don't want it to crash while I was explaining it. So I'm gonna turn it on now, fingers crossed it doesn't crash. So there we go. So one of the reasons that we're, we're going in and doing all of this stuff in pre-production, right? Um, is that we want to figure out where the limits lie before we start making guarantees and cash and checks with directors and stuff like that, right? So when we're looking at like specifically the, the physics stuff, part of that is the expense of it. How much can we get away with within the environment itself? And uh, also just the general stability of it within the environment, right? So as you can see in the in this center top screen, the the cable here is is not behaving itself very well. So this is like an, an issue that we need to identify, right? Is, is that an issue with the physics system with the rope itself? Is there some sort of instability on the back end that we need to address? Is it something that I've done wrong, right? In this instance, I'm almost certain it's something I've done wrong. <laughs> so um, that's actually a good thing. That's an easy fix. I believe it's just clipping into another object. So I just need to move it. But as soon as I turned on the physics, you may have also noticed Oh, it's not done at this time. So this is a thing, right? One of the cables actually de disconnected and fell through the entire level. So that, that's a bug that we need to actually address. It's like, doesn't like connecting to a certain surface. We can't have physicalized items falling through the entire world. That's just not um, a good thing to have happen, right? We want these things to be stable and reliable. And on top of that, as this person comes through, uh, this area here, you can see that we have the cloth interacting correctly with dynamic objects like characters, right? So making sure that that stuff works, the settings we're using on the cloth entities themselves and uh, the way that the physics calculation is handled, handled on the back end is able to cope with that within the environment itself. So this is kind of a, a larger topic, uh, especially when, when in regards to, to physicalized items, right? We wanna have as much as this stuff physical as possible because it brings life to the environment and uh, it's generally it's kind of fun to mess around with in games. I don't know about you guys, but I'm always messing around with any physical item that I find in a game. Like I will kick it, push it, shoot it. So, which you can all do with this stuff, right? which is cool. So yeah, that's um, adding in like a lot more physical elements within the scene. If I go up here as well, we've got another example of just some more hanging cables. So a fairly static scene that just, it just helps significantly. Like even though it's such a small part of the environment, just adding in that little bit of movement is, is really good. We also have another bit of a, a cloth barrier back here that if, if these guys weren't sitting down here being lazy, 
might give us a demo, but they're not in this instance. So yeah, adding in a lot more of that dynamic movement. It also helps us kind of sell specifically in regards to the cloth, um, helps us sell a little bit of the narrative vibe, which is that they want to keep heat in areas, right? So they're not just putting this up just so that people can walk through like them and just, oh, yay, that was fun. It's actually serving a narrative purpose of like keeping heat in this area and not in that area, right? It's the same thing with like you go to a shop and they'll have like these sorts of things. Like either they'll be to keep out flies or they'll be to keep heat in or out, either or, right? So that's basically what we've got going here as well. So yeah, um, so in general, like we finished this pre-production step within our pipeline now, and um, we've learned quite a fair bit in regards to like how we need to construct these stations. So like the, the biggest learning point was basically that we need to have a very, very substantial uh, building set for stuff like rubbish, right? And then also for stuff like cables. So actually figuring out how we can create the density that we need throughout the entire environment. Because even this frame right here, even though there's like a lot of rubbish and a lot of cables, this is nowhere near the density that we need to actually achieve what we want. So we want to find all that stuff as early as possible. And we have, and right now, as we've moved quite further on beyond this point right now, we're already starting to implement a lot of those solutions to the problems and, and already seeing dividends, right? So that's basically the process that we're going through. We've gone in, we've, we've figured out where we need to, we found our performance deficits, we've found creative solutions around them. We've gone in, we've actually uh, relatively well achieved the artistic vision for the vibe that we want for these things, uh, as well as, um, maintaining the uh, game level requirements as well, right? Like the, the gang outposts and um, the ability to go in and, and have shops where they're interactable as well as um, just dressing as well. So that's pretty much where we're at with, with well, at least the VT stuff for the Pirate Space Stations. Uh, th this is like the, the most critical step in the process for figuring out how, how to build these things. And um, this one was, I'm so glad that we, we really gave this one the time of day because, wow, was there a lot of things that we caught on this one that really would have shot us in the foot if we didn't explore them all properly. So, yeah. I think, I think there's a couple of things we want to reiterate, uh, things that folks who uh, maybe uh, weren't here at the beginning uh, might have missed. Hi, I'm Italian Spider-Man. Especially because if anybody wasn't here at the beginning, it's just like, what the heck's going on? Um, <laughs> this is a pre-production thing that we that we were showing. Uh, this is not building the asset that you're going to see in the, the game. This is imagine this as like a giant 3D concept of, of these things. It's seeing what we can do. It's exploring what the technical limitations are. It's identifying the problems that building this will eventually have so that we can find solutions ahead of time and stuff like this. That's where we talk about the trash and the entity count and all that stuff. It, it's to help us discover the new tools and processes that we have to develop in order to make this thing uh, a reality. Uh, then for uh, for the folks in the chat who, who uh, were perhaps talking about, oh, this is too much trash and outlaws aren't like this and they're not messy like this and thing. Uh, remember that we are building an entire galaxy and this is literally one location in one station in one star system and whatnot. Uh, these outlaws are is the simplest answer to that. I'm, I'm sure as the game continues to expand and evolve, you'll see nice, clean, tidy outlaws. You'll see OCD outlaws. You'll see all manner of things. There's no limit on this kind of stuff. So so for, for those of you who were in the chat uh, going a little crazy about all the trash and stuff like that, it's this is just one location, guys. It, it's, it's, it's okay. Maybe this one isn't for you, it's an interesting but it will point, be for though, other so people. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point to bring up, though. Like, um, we've we've also had that internal debate, right? Mm -hmm. Where like, how much rubbish is yeah. is 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 correct, right? And and generally, we also agree that like the areas that 
are being controlled by the gang or like normal people they shouldn't have as much rubbish but then areas outside of the market itself like maybe that's just where people within the market are just throwing their stuff and the gang doesn't care about that so you'll see more of an increase there versus in the actual area itself but um it's funny you mentioned that like maybe there's a tidy gang because uh one of the things that we we wanted to explore with with the gangs themselves is that they do have different personalities right mm -hmm. and uh we'll go into that more like probably down the line but um we definitely do want to do something like that where we can display different gangs personalities in in new and interesting ways for sure yeah uh, we've had scls with the narrative team we're uh, specifically dedicated to the gangs of pyro and uh even though they haven't shared all the gangs, they've shared several different gangs, all with different uh, ethoses and stuff. So th this is literally just one that you're seeing. So, um, all right, man. Um, thank you so much, Josh. I, 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 mean, I, I will say I thought we were dressing up. Um, I thought we had That's agreed fine, to... I didn't want to make a point of it at the beginning, but, I mean, I, 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 I sat here. I came, I came as Italian Spider-Man. And you came as, I don't know, regular Josh, old Aussie. me. Yeah. Sorry, man. Sorry I was disappointed. Disappoint. I'm only the only. Per I'm also the only person that showed up to the leads meeting. <laughs> dressed. So I was. I was. I was clearly misinformed. I appreciate the commitment. All right. So yeah. Uh, folks, that was uh, Outlaw Lifestyles. That was uh, uh, the expanded uh, 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 artist edition version of the presentation that we gave uh, at CitizenCon. Um, I owed it to Josh. It was a it was a heartbreaking decision to have to cut it down for uh, for, for for CitizenCon. But when I did it, I promised I'd give him an opportunity to do the whole thing, and I I've, and I think it was well worth seeing because these things are amazing. Uh, I, I I'll, I'll love them. So yeah. Um, that's it for our show. Uh, ISC uh, returns uh, next week. Uh, I think it's what November fourth. Uh, it's we're coming back with a feature on uh, mining gadgets, uh, the latest uh, update to the mining gameplay, and of course everybody's favorite a sprint report. Uh, so yeah, so that is, uh, and then we'll be right back here uh, next week on SCL. Uh, I think we're currently scheduled for the UI team. Uh, we'll see if that happens. Things always jumble around. So that is Josh right there. Uh, I am uh, Italian Spider-Man. And uh, uh, we'll go ahead and do, let's, let's do the opening video again one more time. Let's see before we leave it. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Italian Spider-Man. Pronto. <laughs> Terrore Suspenso Spider, 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 Spider Spider Bye, Spider Spider, spider. spider.